Hi, my name's Sarah. I'm a scientist here at Science North. And today, we're going to talk about molecules. Now, on the surface, we don't see molecules. If I were to ask you what was in each of these graduated cylinders, you may take an educated guest and say, they're both water. They're colorless liquids. And really, the most abundant colorless liquid that I know of is water. In fact, these are two very different liquids. This one is a polar substance. This one is a non-polar substance. In here, we have ethanol. In here, we have water. Take note that they both have 200 milliliters each. And watch what happens when we pour the ethanol into the water. I hope you weren't expecting a big explosion. Essentially, when we mix ethanol and water, we get a mixture of ethanol and water. We call this a solution. What's really interesting, though, is that you'll notice that we don't get 400 milliliters of our solution. According to this, we get around 370 milliliters of ethanol water solution. You might, have, you might think that's a little bit weird. 200 mils, 200 mils, 400 mils? Not quite the same. The reason for that is because one was a polar molecule and one was a non-polar molecule. I like to think of polar molecules in terms of magnetism. If you think of a, of a magnet, we have a north end, we have a south end. When we think of a polar molecule, you have an end that's slightly negatively charged and a different end that's slightly positively charged. The same with water, which means if I tried to jam a whole bunch of magnets into this graduated cylinder, I wouldn't get as many if they weren't charged. So when they're charged, they kind of push each other apart um, in some instances. So essentially, the ethanol, the non-polar molecule, the non-magnetic material, kind of slips in between those polar molecules, so we get less volume. So this is a really nice example of a solution because you can't tell that there's two different things inside the graduated cylinder, but there are. And that's really what a solution is all about. Think of salt water versus plain water. Salt water is filled up with salt, but you don't see it. It's a solution. We're going to move on and talk about supersaturated solutions next. This is a supersaturated solution. Again, it might just look like plain water, but inside are all sorts of sodium acetate crystals that have been dissolved. Now, I had to dissolve this at high heat in order to get it to be super saturated. Essentially, there's more crystals than should fit inside water at room temperature. I did this a few hours ago, and so now it's cooled off to room temperature. And on the watch glass, I have a few sodium acetate crystals that should allow this to come out of solution in a kind of unique way. So if I did it right, we'll see uh, something really interesting right now. Clearly, if that was plain water, this would never have happened. This was a super saturated solution, and as soon as we've unbalanced the equilibrium, pouring it out of the container and having those little bits of crystals to start it really allow the crystals to precipitate out, and we get this. This is the same thing as what was in here, however. There's no change, and that's what we're going to talk about next is physical and chemical change and kind of how you can see the difference, or sometimes not. All right, so we just saw a liquid turn into a solid, and it was in fact a physical change. It went from liquid sodium acetate to a solid sodium acetate and water solution. Now what I want to do is go from a liquid to a solid, but in a chemical change. So in the big beaker here, I have calcium chloride mixed up with water in solution. You can't tell that there's calcium chloride in there, just like before, and you can tell uh, there was sodium acetate, but there is. Um, and in here, we have sodium alginate. Now, when I mix the two together, I'll just pour some in, you still 
may not really see a solid. It's not as evident, let's say, as the sodium acetate was, but it's there. And this, in fact, is a chemical change. Essentially what happened are the molecules of calcium chloride reacted with the molecules of sodium alginate to form these long chains, or polymers as we call them, and made this kind of goopy, long, um, long molecule. That's in fact a solid. We're gonna talk about states of matter. There are three classical states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. The main difference between solids, liquids, and gases are how far apart the particles are from one another and how much they vibrate or move. Solids are nice and packed tightly together. They don't vibrate too, too much, and they certainly don't move very much either. When you get into a liquid state, those particles have a little bit more energy, they move a little bit more, they vibrate faster, and they're further apart from one another. When you get into gases, it's even more pronounced. They vibrate a lot more, they move a lot more, and they're a lot farther away from one another. I have in the doer here a really great substance that'll help us see the difference between liquids and gases. In here, we have liquid nitrogen. Now, liquid nitrogen is really, really, really cold. Um, so it's a really good substance to do this demonstration with. So essentially, I'm gonna take some out and you can see it boiling away right now. Now, often we think of boiling as hot because we usually reference water and water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, which is very hot. This stuff happens to boil at anything warmer than minus 196 degrees Celsius. Clearly, it's a lot warmer in here than that. So we have liquid turning into a gas, which is the definition of boiling. Now, when I take this liquid and pour it into the flask, Although not all of it makes it in. You'll see I have about half a flask of liquid nitrogen. That's important because I want you to notice how much liquid it takes to give a certain volume of gas. So we're gonna put a balloon on here and catch, capture, catch the gas as it's released and see how much we can get. And I'm just gonna move over to this side of the cart let that do its thing. And we're gonna do the opposite over here. We're gonna take gas, and we're gonna see if we can cool it down or slow those particles down enough to turn them into a liquid. So notice that balloon over there getting quite large, and there's still quite a bit of liquid in the flask. Just push this in. Try to do this without popping my balloon. Oh, so that was a huge amount of gas and we still have quite a bit of liquid left in the flask. So a little tiny bit of liquid turns into a big volume of gas, not because there's more of it, but because the particles are more spread apart. Now on this side, we had a, a fairly good sized balloon and you can see what happened to our balloon. And if you can see up close, you can see the little bit of liquid bouncing around inside the balloon. All that gas kind of stopped vibrating so much, stopped moving so much. The particles got closer together and formed a liquid, liquid air, inside of the balloon. And when we heat it back up, It's back to the same state as when I put the gas in there in the first place. So that's states of matter.